Now I'm going to introduce to you uh, Mr. Danny Pleasant, who is with the city of Charlotte, North Carolina. And Danny's been with the city for about a little over 10 years. And he's been there while the city has built um, its first segment of light rail, has advanced planning for bus rapid transit, for commuter rail, for streetcar, for every one of the technologies that George has talked about. And Danny's going to share with us how Charlotte, the city, the community, created a long-range master plan and how they're making it happen and why that's working and some uh, thoughts about how what's important for us to understand as we move forward so this is Danny Pleasant thank you Tim um, I'm an urban designer disguised as a transportation executive <clears throat> um, and that's really true if you'll look at the back of your page my uh, training is in actually uh, actually is in city planning um, I was fortunate enough to go to Texas A&M where, as a hungry graduate student, they were offering jobs at the Texas Transportation Institute, so I got um, to uh, experience a transportation career, and I've been doing that for a long time. <clears throat> and I also want you to know that I have a great deal of optimism about cities, about my city, about your city, uh, about cities in general, and I have that optimism for three reasons. Reason number one is millennials. Reason number two is baby boomers, and reason number three are people like you. Uh, the millennials and baby boomers are important because they're huge population cohorts within our society. The millennials have great interest in urban living. They have great interest in going to the cities, and cities like mine and cities like you are at risk of losing our best and brightest to cities like Washington, D.C., and New York, and Boston, and San Francisco because they have what those folks are looking for. But there are plenty of them that would like to stay in different places. They would like the climate of a Tampa or the beauty of a Charlotte, but will <coughs> um, move because those places are not offering what they want. So I think it's imperative that as we think our way through this, uh, we, will, we think about those populations. Baby boomers, again, retirement-minded, looking for a different environment, and people like you who bother to show up to help inform your city of what you want it to be as you proceed through your life. So that's uh, what I wanted to talk about today. But I want to try to get to a point, uh, because I'm a guy that is responsible for fixing the potholes, making sure the traffic signals operate correctly, making sure that we do our long-range planning correctly, making sure that development comes into the city in a way that is helpful, both to the development and to the city at large. And so. Uh, that's what I do, and I do it for a large city. As you can see, uh, there's some of the statistics on our city. Um, and we do it um, because we want our city to be vi vital. We want our city to be prosperous. We want people who work there to be able to get good jobs and to stay there. And so that's why we care about these things. We are a growth center. We uh, have been named by the Census Bureau as the fastest growing urban area over a million population in the country. Uh, between 2000 and 2010. And uh, within the city, we're, uh, we're looking to grow within the city limits the populations of some of these great cities like Pittsburgh and St. Louis and Cincinnati. Um, and we're developing in a typical Sun Belt unconstrained motif. This was in 1976. The lighter shades are, uh, were the developed land back then. And then we look at 2010. And you can see how we've absorbed that land. Now, what's interesting is that between 1950 and, um, and 2000 even, and that's not even now, we basically cut our population density in half. While we grew a tremendous population, the density is less than half of what, or is about half of what it was in 1950. So that's important. Growth um, has its impacts. Some of it are positive. There are good things about growth. And some of, the, some of it is negative. It can, be, it can uh, lead to some problems. And um, so as we look at our future and the pace at which we're growing and the pattern at which we were growing, we realize that we've really got to think differently about just about everything. And since I'm the transportation guy, we think differently about our transportation system as well. So as we, as we grew into the future and will continue to grow, the city uh, asks itself the fundamental question that most all cities that are growth cities uh, want to ask themselves. How do you accommodate that growth and do it in a way that's positive and helpful? 
And so out of that, we really stepped out there and we stated what our vision is and every city needs to figure out what their vision is for the future. Um, and we just recognized that we want to be a city of choices. And that's a loaded word because that means choices in housing and working environments and the way you get around, the way you have leisure, the way you educate. Um, and we also want that sustainable growth that actually improves the quality of life and makes us a better place. And the growth framework that we came upon as we thought our way through this, we call it centers, corridors, and wedges. And it's simply recognizing and organizing growth in such a way that you use the assets that you have, you use the infrastructure that's in place to the best of your ability to grow on that infrastructure because we all as taxpayers like to know that, that those dollars are being used very efficiently and effectively when they're invested. And so if we grow for us um, along those historical patterns, those development patterns along those uh, transportation corridors and within the centers that are already established, that's going to be a much more efficient way for us to use our tax dollars to grow. Um, and then we defined the specific boundaries from a, a big concept. We really went down to the boundary level and started then calibrating our codes and our ordinances and our design guidelines so that we did the right kind of treatment in the centers, the right kind of treatment in the corridors, and the right kind of treatment in the, in the wedges. And this has been an evolving process to think our way through the centers, corridors, and wedges uh, growth framework um, so that we can define those measures for when we've succeeded. And as we move through that process of thinking about how we operationalize this growth concept, we realize that everything we do as a city, from transportation to how we treat the environment to how we think about economic development and neighborhood improvement and build infrastructure and set aside open space and do public transportation, that all follows this growth pattern that we have envisioned for ourselves. And then we take it down to the next level. We take it down to the real organizational level. This chart, which you're not going to be able to read in detail, is just to give you a sense of how we organize our thinking. And this is called our balanced scorecard. It's the way we, at a glance, operate the business and the corporation that we call the city of Charlotte. And that balanced scorecard has all those components in there that we need that we can really focus down on, on, on the task at hand. We can measure our outcome because you, if you're in business, you know that if you can't measure it, you can't tell how it's performing. You can't decide if it's successful. <clears throat> so from a transportation uh, area, we have five focus areas within this balanced scorecard. Um, from the transportation uh, focus area plan, we make a statement that we want city to be Charlotte to be the premier city in the country for integrating land use and transportation choices. That means it's not all about transportation, it's not all about land use, but together we recognize those two things are going to be important to shaping our community. So out of those five focus areas that we have, you can see them on the right hand side of the screen, these are uh, adopted by city council to guide the work that we do in the city. And within the city council, the city council assigns council members to these committees, these five committees that track the focus areas. And then we as a staff at the executive level have the focus area cabinets that, that does the work that the, the city council has asked us to do around those focus areas. For transportation, this is more or less what it looks like. The top of the graph is our Charlotte's vision for the future, as stated. And there's, there's a lot of dialogue around that and a lot of written stuff about that. The centers, quarters, and wedges growth framework then tells us how we accommodate the physical space and the physical attributes of our, our community so that they can work. Underneath that, because this is a transportation uh, uh, talk, is the transportation action plan, which is our comprehensive transportation plan, multimodal, all modes, um, automobiles, buses, transit, walking, bicycling, all that. And then out of the transportation action plan flows these various uh, components of the transportation system that we focus on. So it's all integrated in our organizational thinking, and that's the message I, I want to give to you today. So our transportation action plan, uh, these are the five goals abbreviated uh, quite severely of the transportation action plan. I want to draw your attention to the first one. It really leads off with this idea that we have a part in transportation of continuing implementation of the centers, quarters, and wedges growth strategy. It is a direct land use connection, first and foremost, out of the box. And then goal number two is the stuff that you would expect in a transportation plan. How do you build transportation infrastructure so that it works rightly for your city? 
And then certainly uh, we put a huge value on collaborate, collaboration. Um, it's a high level expectation of our city manager and our city executive team and our city council that we're talking to each other. We're working together both internally and externally in the city to make sure that, that these things aren't happening, happening in a vacuum. And it's so, so easy for us as subject uh, area specialists to get into our silos and really think only one way about th the work that we do. And communication of these land use objectives and then seeking that financial help to get us to where we need to go, those financial resources are all important. Um, part of our work is through the Urban Street Design Guidelines. Ian gave you an excellent talk about the importance of streets. And I want to tell you that my belief as a transportation director of the City of Charlotte um, and that of my staff is that streets first and foremost are public space. They are part of the public realm. I'm the largest real estate manager in the city of Charlotte. I manage 25,000 acres of real estate. And if your transportation executives aren't thinking like that, like they're stewards of a real estate asset, then they need to think it again. Public streets are your number one way to inform visitors to your city and the people who live here the quality of your city. 100% of your citizens and 100% of your visitors will experience your city by the streets. And so that is your stage. Um, certainly the development bones, everybody understands that you don't develop without streets. Context-based means you build the right street for the right location. So Ian's given you all the good stuff you need to know about good streets. He also gave you what you need to know about network and the importance of keeping that street network intact. This particular graphic indicates the shaded part indicates where the old part of the traditionally developed city of Charlotte is and the outside of that is the part that is developed in the suburban pattern post-World War II suburban pattern of the late half of the 20th century. The little red dots indicate where traffic congestion is most prominent in the city and you can see the dominant traffic congestion is outside the center city, and the center city is a place just like here where most of the jobs are, uh, the highest population density, all the civic attractions, and most of the great destinations people want to go to, but because of the network, we can handle it. And up until, you know, up until the first half of the 20th century, these networks, as Ian showed you, grew organically almost. The next developer built the grid, the next developer built the grid, the next developer built the grid. And so we, trans we transferred that responsibility in the last half of the 20th century from the private sector development industry to the public sector because all those streets now go to that arterial network that guess who is responsible for maintaining? We are, to widen it, to build those intersections. And so uh, the thought is you've got a great gridded street network, protect it because that's, that's your great asset. And then all cities have the tools to implement these plans. You have zoning codes, you have subdivision ordinances, you have area plans, you have all the stuff that you need to implement those plans. And so getting those ordinances in alignment is huge. It's giant that you've got to get that right. Now let's switch over to transit planning a bit because um, I know there's a huge amount of interest in the room for that. This represents sort of our very simplified transit plan. It's based on centers, quarters, and wedges. So there are five corridor projects in there. And then we have streetcar, which is more of a, a circulator type of an element. And all those quarters tend to have a technology associated with them that you've heard about all the technologies. And um, so the, the right technology is matched with the right quarter in this case, we believe. In 1998, uh, prior to uh, the voters agreeing to uh, approve a half cent sales tax for transit in Mecklenburg County, our county, we had a, a very basic transit system that was designed really for the most transit dependent members of our city, uh, of our citizens. And um, since then we've been able to grow and expand the transit system so that it covers uh, enhanced bus, it covers uh, much more frequency, much more coverage, many more express routes, and uh, really creates a much more robust system. And we were able to build um, our first light rail um, um, line in the south quarter of Charlotte uh, with that half penny of sales tax. And that opened in 2007. It opened as a great success. Um, it gets uh, in the 15 to 16,000 passengers a day. We had expected opening day to be in the seven or 8,000 range. And as soon as it opened, 
it, it was hitting ridership that we expected in 30 years. And so we've since had to go back and expand some platforms to buy some new cars, to add some more capacity to that first leg. So it's been a tremendous success. Now I need to tell you, we did not, we did not build it primarily as a transportation solution. We built it primarily as a redevelopment solution, as a redevelopment tool. And um, if, as you can see from this aerial photo, um, the newer buildings that you can see in the photo, the bigger buildings have all been built in the last five years or so, and the light rail station uh, at, at Bland is right there. And so they all really uh, clustered around there, and this is a shot more or less from the ground level and the station level of what some of that development looks like. And then we have apartment buildings like this, we have restaurants, we have ground floor retail. Um, this is part of an old uh, uh, textile center, so a lot of those great old buildings are now housing other uses because they were built well in the first place. And in the south quarter alone, about 10 miles um, from Center City to the south, we've seen a tremendous amount of response from, from the development industry, and it did exactly what we wanted it to. It really brought that value back into that quarter, and you can see that's 1.86 billion with a B, Mayor, of tax value that came into that quarter that would not have otherwise been there. And that is not including what happened in the center city because we didn't think we could be arrogant enough to claim the center city development that's been pretty substantial was associated necessarily with light rail. We know that it's, it's there, but um, that's huge. So what's coming next? Uh, an extension of the blue line is currently under design. Uh, we have full funding grant agreement with our state and uh, it looks like it's coming pretty quickly at the federal level as well. And I believe it's the only project in the country now, a New Starts project that's been uh, called out in the administration's budget for funding. <clears throat> so we're real happy about that. So that's the next leg. Uh, we're also working on a commuter rail line to the north. It's about 25 miles and it really uh, serves those suburban cities to the north of us. And then we, we've got a streetcar uh, project that's underway. It's part of our plan. So we're looking at a very small section, about a mile and a half, just as a little starter line that's been funded that we will start work on in the fall. We'll actually start construction in the fall. There's a kind of an interesting story behind this one. This, this street, Elizabeth Avenue, uh, a few years ago looked just like this, and we decided we needed a streetscape project in there. And as we were planning for that streetscape project, we had a developer grub properties that came by and said, well, you know, I'm working on acquiring a bunch of the property alongside this street on the right-hand side and the left-hand side of the photo. And I'd li really like to be part a partner with the city to make this the kind of place that it needs to be. Now this was um, on our plans uh, designated for streetcar project. And um, so we took a chance and when we did the streetscape project, five or six years, maybe seven years ago now, we took a chance and we found another $5 million and we decided, well, let's go ahead and put the, the tracks in. Let's go ahead and build the, the light standards to such a strength that the Canton area can fit there over time. and you know, we'll say our prayers and hope we don't get in trouble by spending that money too far in advance and wait for, for light rail or for a streetcar to come. And so a uh, streetcar is coming. It'll be uh, open in probably a year and a half from now. And this is sort of the vision of what that can look like in the future as we move forward. And this is the vision that the developer worked on for the land that he has already purchased. Um, the, a big hospital uh, conglomerate there is funding a lot, financing a lot of this development uh, to take place, and it's it had its setback just like development has generally with the economic conditions. They're starting to work on that again. So the city, our county, uh, partnered with these various development interests in uh, really creating uh, the kind of place that we're going to look forward to opening up. There's also a large community college there along the corridor um, as well. So just in summary for the transit char characteristics, I think the lessons that we can, uh, that you can learn from Charlotte and take with you is make sure that, as you heard um, the previous speaker talk about, make sure you give the right application to the right context and, and doing the right kind of job for you in order to be successful. Some of these are gonna be better at development than others. Some are better at carrying large numbers of people than others, but you just really gotta make sure it fits right. And this is sort of our, menu of things that uh, appear in our plan as well. Now, if you don't take anything else away from my talk, and this is really my passion because uh, I'm, I love cities, I'm optimistic about cities, and I think the future is, is gonna be favorable, and we as um, 
people who love cities ha have to be very careful that we make the right moves to prepare for the future. Uh, the Knight um, Foundation uh, operates in those cities that traditionally have had newspapers that were published by the Knight Group. And they do this thing called a soul of community uh, that they hire the Gallup organization to do this. And each city kind of has a different outcome. In our particular city, uh, our citizens told us that the reason they really love Charlotte is because it's a beautiful area. It's got a physical beauty that they like. They also like the openness of the people and the ability to socialize and uh, finds that that really is that sort of that, that emotional response that people have that want to be part of our city. And so it's really important for us that our city look the best it can. And as I told you, that look comes from uh, its street system. As they delved further into this, they also realized that when people are emotionally attached to their community, they want to stay there, they want to open businesses, they want to create jobs, their kids want to be there, they want to be part of that lively, vibrant nature of the city. So I wanted to just leave you with that thought and just thanks for your attention.